Imagine a world where a cross is used to decorate a body and half a pair of gloves from your ex-lover is placed on the altar of God to pray. It is this mixed world that Pope makes fun of and it is this mixed world we see reflected in the second canto. Hello and welcome everyone. You are watching Nibble Pop and we are doing this video series on Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock. Today in this video, we are going to look at the second canto of this mock epic and try to see where and how this canto becomes very significant so far as the whole structure of the epic is concerned. Stay with me till the end of this video because I'm not going to skip any single line and we'll explain everything to you so that you won't need any guidebook if you pay close attention. So sit with your notebooks to scribble down everything you want to. Stay subscribed and if you haven't subscribed yet, I would really love you to. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. So in Canto 1, we had seen that Belinda, she wakes up and gets ready. And therefore, we are left with a kind of expectation as to where is she going to go now. She is all decked up and definitely she has some plans for her day. So Canto 2 will give us some idea as to where she is going and why she is so dressed up and what happens to these tiny little selves there. Now while I read the text, you will notice that I usually give the meanings in modern English parallelly on the whiteboard next to me. So if you are confused about word meanings of any difficult words, look at the paraphrase in English which is given down there and you will definitely find the meanings of the difficult words there. And sometimes in our readings, we come across phrases and lines where Pope is borrowing from any previous epic poet or any other poet. In that case, I'm going to mention his past references and these references will come very handy if you are asked to attempt any reference to context type questions where, you know, these examiners, they uh, take up uh, a couple of lines and want you to write, uh, say, half page on it for five marks. So here you will get both the literal meanings as well as the literary references, okay? Let's start. Not with more glories in the ethereal plain, the sun first rises over the purpled main. In the first canto too, we have seen that uh, this whole episode about Belinda and her morning dream, this begins with Sol or the sun god. Here also we see that the canto begins with reference to the sun directly. The meaning is, it's morning and the sun has risen, but not with more glories does the sun rise than, the third line, than issuing forth the rival of his beams launched on the bosom of the silver Thames. So now I'll explain to you what is rival of his beams and what is the connection here. Then you'll understand these four lines. See, Belinda is always compared to the sun repeatedly and that is the beauty of this poem that Pope does not use a particular kind of imagery and leave it there. He, he kind of continues uh, these metaphors, these symbols and these associations and he calls Belinda the rival of the sun. Rival means a competitor. So it's not just her eyes but her whole personality. Uh, that is very sunny and is very bright. And therefore, he says that when Belinda comes forth, then even the sun is eclipsed. The sun is less glorious compared to her. And what is she doing now? Launched on the bosom of the silver Thames. Now, Thames is the main river of London, runs through London. 
and it's silver because it's like sparkling uh, with brightness and on this river Belinda is on a vessel on a cruise on a pleasure trip uh, with of course her friends fair nymphs and well-dressed youths around her shone but every eye was fixed on her alone so this is how Pope is establishing the superiority of Belinda and what is this superiority based on it's based on her external appearance uh, there is no question about her intelligence her intellect or other human qualities it's entirely on her beauty and that to her made up beauty and this whole idea of you know issuing forth this is like kind of bodily taken from uh, Spencer's prothalamion and uh, there the lines are like this from those high towers this noble lord issuing like radiant Hesper when his golden hair in the ocean below he had bathed fair descended to the rivers open viewing so why am I uh, talking about Spencer here? It's not just because of this uh, phrase, you know, issuing forth and talking about this river, but also because of the fact that the Baron in the poem, the person who snips off Belinda's lock, uh, that character is based on the character of Lord Peter. And Lord Peter happened to be a descendant of William Peter, who was one of the bridegrooms in Spencer's poem, Prothalamian. So, this phrase was probably deliberately used uh, because of this connection that Pope knew about. On her white breast, a sparkling cross she wore. So, Belinda was wearing this cross on her chest, which Jews might kiss and infidels adore. Jews are of course the people uh, who are not Christians and are usually considered to be uh, quite reluctant to consider Christ as any uh, divine figure in that sense. Infidels in general mean people who don't believe in religion, who are like people who are unfaithful to God, that way we can say. Now, under no circumstance can a Jew or an infidel appreciate or adore a cross because cross is not just an ornament, it's like a, a very potent symbol of Christianity. It stands for Jesus Christ on his cross sacrificing himself for the sake of humanity. So cross is a heavily laden symbol of sacrifice of divinity which is recognized by the Christians alone but when Belinda is wearing a cross even Jews and infidels would stare at the cross are they really staring at the cross no they are staring at her body so this is Belinda's beauty which transforms the cross from being a religious super powerful symbol to a mere decorative item. So we can say this is kind of a sacrilege you know going against religious sentiments in a way and Pope is not scared to do this because he knows that in the world view of Belinda in her whole idea of life priorities are often confused. And we have seen that she is keeping this Bible on her dressing table. So it's very natural uh, that she would treat the cross as her ornament. Now before judging Belinda, tell me, don't we do that ourselves? I'm talking about uh, my Hindu subscribers, especially women. Don't we wear Ganesh ji uh, as uh, earrings and as pendants we do right so we don't understand the thing that religious symbols when transformed into ornaments they lose that kind of value which we would associate with them otherwise I am not against that Pope is questioning whether wearing a cross is really about glorification of Christ anymore or is it just 
a piece of ornament. Her lively looks, a sprightly mind disclose. Quick as her eyes and as unfixed as those. Now, usually we see that if a person is a thinker, uh, has intellect and is capable of focus, attention, then they have a comparatively fixed gaze and they are not very fidgety about looking here and there when they are somewhere. They know what they want to look at be it another person, be it something else, be it some beautiful thing. But when Belinda comes forth, she is looking at everybody, not focusing on any one single person. Why? One, because she doesn't have any idea about what she actually wants. And second, she wants to attract everybody's attention. So she is like scattering her gaze everywhere. She is not focusing anywhere. She is not capable of focusing except when she is putting makeup on her face. Then she is extremely focused. So when he uses the expression, quick as her eyes and as unfixed as those, uh, this is again a parallel or rather a contrast to uh, Virgil's Aeneid whose uh, eyes are frequently called, you know, defixus lumina, uh, which means fixed on the ground, focused. Unlike that, Belinda's eyes are always, uh, you know, moving about. Favors to none, to all she smiles extends. So Belinda doesn't play favorites. She smiles at everybody because she wants to be smiled at by everybody. Oft she rejects, but never once offends. What does she reject? She rejects perhaps any personal advance. Somebody wants a date with her. Uh, some personal favor, some extra additional time, this she is rejecting but without offending because she is smiling so gracefully that people can't be angry with her. And then that sun imagery, that sun parallelism comes in again. Bright as the sun, her eyes, the gazers strike and like the sun, they shine on all alike. So she is like the sun and when the sun gets up in the morning and shines on all of us, does it discriminate? Does it shine on some person more and shine on some person less? No, it shines equally. Now, if Belinda is the sun or the sun goddess almost herself, then she should also behave like the sun and shine on all alike. So this is where uh, we see this duality in Belinda. Really, what do we call this? Do we call this her flirtatious nature or her gracious nature? Then if it is her flirtatious nature, then is the sun flirtatious? Because the sun does this just like Belinda is doing. So these are the moments where Belinda's beauty is truly deified. Deified means turned into divinity. And why does Pope do that. Why does he make her look so beautiful and gracious? Because unless he magnifies her, he cannot bring her down. It's like if you don't inflate a balloon, there's no fun in putting a pin through it, is there? The more you inflate, the bigger boom it's going to give you. Yet graceful ease and sweetness void of pride. I don't know why he is calling her void of pride because she was performing sacred rites of pride earlier when she was getting ready. And then here we actually see her rejecting people. So of course, she is quite proud of herself, but it's a way of hitting at her when he is saying sweetness void of pride might hide her faults. Her sweetness hides her faults and then the Pope adds if bells had faults to hide. Now, see, women don't have any faults, but even if she had, her sweetness would hide it. Now, that is Pope attacking women in general. So, that feminist alert should be ringing in your heads. But here, he is not saying women had faults to hide, but bells. You know, all women are not bells. Bells are especially these women who present themselves in these high class society parties, dressed like a doll. So, of course, it's okay to criticize them 
because they are dehumanizing themselves. Maybe they are appearing to be as graceful as the sun, but in that appearance is that artificiality that Pope is rejecting here, questioning here. Okay? If to her share some female errors fall, look on her face and you will forget them all. Why is Pope saying this? Is because when it comes to women, people usually tend to ignore any faults. If they appear good, if they look good, and that is an idea which Pope violently speaks against because he is a man who is dead against judging someone because of appearance. And this is what happens in the world. In an interview, if a person goes in and there's another person with uh, almost similar marks and abilities, then usually if out of them somebody actually looks very good and is well dressed, then the job belongs to them. So that is a general tendency uh, that beauty is considered to be a criteria of judgment most of the time. Now he continues with Belinda's beauty. This nymph, nymph again Belinda, to the destruction of mankind because she wants to destroy mankind, she is doing something. What is she doing? Nourished two locks which graceful hung behind in equal curls. So she had two locks. Locks means uh, you know a, a whole bunch of hair, uh, usually twisted and twirled, and you know it, it falls back like this, and uh, stays around the neck that is the lock and well conspired to deck with shining ringlets the smooth ivory neck. So when you curl the hair uh, with paper colors or heat or whatever, then they become like these ringlets, small little rings uh, on the side of your head and that kind of accentuates the beauty of the neck area. Although it looks extremely artificial, but that is a very common uh, hairstyle practice we see even in our countries. It's very common. But look at the words Pope is using here. Destruction, conspired. Why is he using these words? Because this lock is not just a beauty addition to Belinda. They are like weapons to her. So this is what happens with Pope, he keeps on changing the associated values or the values associated with objects usually like we associate cross with religious devotion and he makes it an object of decoration. We associate curls with beauty addition, he makes them look like weapons that Belinda is using to destroy mankind. Why destroy mankind? Because people will look at that lock, would want to obtain it and would fall in love with her and that is how they will destroy themselves. So this is how Pope is manipulating the usual values we associate with certain objects. And this continues in the next few lines. Love in these labyrinths his slaves detains. So these are like traps to enslave men. And mighty hearts are held in slender chains. So they are like chains to tie down hearts which fall for Belinda. With hairy springes we the birds betray. So when people catch birds, they lay these fine uh, thread traps and the birds get trapped there. Uh, and this is compared to the locks of Belinda. Slight lines of hair surprise the finny prey, fin, fins the fish, uh, they have fins and finny prey here means the fish. So when we catch fish, we make use of uh, lines of hair, it's not human hair, but they are also very thread like things which are used to trap. So all these comparisons, they are sinister, dark, not very positive. Enslavement, chaining down somebody, imprisoning somebody, catching the birds and then trapping the fish. So all these images 
are negative and they are used to compare with Belinda's lock. And this is done in the style of almost epic similes. Again, if you have seen my classes on Paradise Lost, you would know what I am talking about. Epic similes are where something is compared to something as in simile, but that comparison goes beyond just the immediate literal comparison. So, the nets used for trapping birds, they are made of hair like structure or threads. Similarly, Belinda's lock is made of hair. So, there the simile does not end because it is an epic simile kind of thing. And what is here happening that just as the nets they end up trapping the birds, taking away their freedom. Similarly, Belinda's hair traps the hearts of men and they are also not free anymore. They are also trapped in her love. So, that comparison is just more than what it actually presents. Fair tresses, man's imperial race ensnare and beauty draws us with a single hair. So, that is the contradiction that Pope points at that this world is so vain, so unthinking that destruction of cities are caused because of beauty. So, Pope here is not just talking about destruction of mankind uh, which is because of Belinda's lock because that is something very preposterous, that is something very silly to think of, right? We all know that how can a beautiful girl be the reason of destruction? But when we see that in the story of the Trojan War, when we read the epic, the Iliad, then we do not ask these questions. There we accept the fact that beauty can be the reason for a super scale destruction. So, that is what Pope does here. He does not just make fun of Belinda. He makes fun of this world in where Trojan wars take place and are glorified. And that world is no different from the world of Belinda, where beauty is seen to be a deadly weapon, an agent of mass destruction. Now, we come to the other character. What is the other character doing? Enough of Belinda. The adventurous Baron the hero or rather the anti-hero of this story. The bright locks admired. Now, he was no different from others. If everybody was attracted to Belinda's locks, the Baron was also attracted. He saw, he wished and to the prize aspired. Now, when you admire somebody's hair, what do you actually want to do with it? Does it mean that you want to get that lock of hair. We do not do that. If we like somebody's eyes, do we want to you know, gouge it out? No, we do not. Because here, when these words are used, resolved to win, uh, then prize aspired, he saw, he wished, it means that he wants to be close to Belinda. He wants to get the recognition from Belinda. But we know that she does not favor any one single person. She distributes her beauty generously, equally to all. So, this lock becomes a universal thing. Trying to possess the lock means wanting to have exclusive right to the locks and indirectly exclusive rights to Belinda. So, definitely there is a sexual connotation to the desire of the baron who wants to possess the locks. Resolved to win, he meditates the way. So, he thinks about the way. How can I get hold of the locks? By force to ravish or by fraud betray. Now, again, this is like Satan's lines of thought, you know. He wants to get hold of heaven back or he wants to get back at God either by force or by fraud. And not just Satan. What about the Trojan horse? If you are familiar with the story of Troy or the battle of Troy, you would know that the battle was won by fraud. Late at night, the citizens of Troy who accepted a huge wooden horse as a parting gift 
from the enemies and they thought that the enemies had departed. They had taken that horse in and from inside the horse it was a structure, wooden structure, big ship like structure. Warriors came out at night and they opened the gates and the reinforcing armies, they came, plundered the whole city of Troy and it was destroyed, demolished. In stories of Mahabharata, in the wars of Kurukshetra, in the fight of Bali and Shugrib in Ramayana, fraud is everywhere because you cannot win always just by fighting brute force. Fraud means where you take your enemy by surprise. And this Baron, his actions are going to be a silly reenactment of all these attempts of fraud that have won battles in both Eastern and Western epics. For when success a lover's toil attends, few ask if fraud or force attend his ends. Because it's, it's very natural, uh, we don't ask questions uh, as to what the procedure was or what the way was if the destination is reached. It is as if victory justifies the methods of obtaining the victory. The end justifies the means. And he's talking about lover's toil, efforts, the sufferings of a lover or labor of a lover. But it also applies to battles. And mostly because history is written by the victorious, people who win. So they will somehow manage to justify the way they one and that is the irony for when success a lover's toil attends few ask if fraud or force attend his ends for this now what does the baron do to ensure that he obtains the locks of belinda our phoebus rose before the sun rose so this is something which is happening uh, quite early uh, before sunrise belinda was still sleeping in her bed at her uh, bed chamber, the baron had got up. He was literally sleepless, it seems. He had implored propitious heaven and every power adored. So that was the moment when the baron was praying ardently. And what was it doing then? But chiefly love. So he was praying to the god of love, Cupid, to love an altar built. Now, when we pray to some particular God, we try to do it in a very systematic way, uh, you know, decorating uh, an altar, Diwali is coming up, we are all thinking about what kind of decorations we will do while offering the puja. Similarly, this guy, he made an altar. Now, what do we make an altar with? Usually with flowers, uh, scented objects like incense sticks, dia, uh, candles if you are Christian uh, and um, brass candlesticks okay so that is what you uh, prepare your altar with shiny objects religious symbols what is he making an altar with now that is the mockery of religious practices rituals here let's see of 12 vast french romances neatly gilt now as i was telling earlier in some video that Romances were very popular during this time, you know, love stories, French novels. And this man, he had these volumes of French novels, neatly gilt, which means that uh, they had these decorative spines, the books, maybe with some golden engravings and things. And he had made a frame-like structure with the 12 novels. So that looks like an altar. There lay three garters, half a pair of gloves and all the trophies of his former loves. So this man, the Baron, he of course had multiple affairs previously and uh, he still is in possession of uh, various tokens of love that were given to him by his lovers. Maybe somebody gave him half a pair of gloves, that is one glove, some garters and multiple other things. Pope doesn't even want to mention them here. And then what does he do? He lights a pyre. The pyre is that fire which you light uh, during any religious ritual. And usually it is not a Christian thing. Uh, it is more like a pagan 
ritual that Pope is talking about. We also have that uh, kind of rituals in Hinduism, uh, in the home that we perform. So, he is acting like a pagan here, praying to this God of love, decorating the altar with objects which would be actually sacrilegious to a Christian. Sacrilegious means something which is offensive to a religious person. And how does he light this fire? What do we light a fire of rituals with? With ghee, with sacred wood pieces, maybe a bit of camphor in it that gives a religious effect to it, right? What is he lighting the fire with? With tender biladu, he lights the pyre. He lights the pyre with love letters that he still has with him in his possession. Love letters from his previous loves, of course. Where have we had this expression biladu earlier? In the first canto, twice. Once, when Belinda was getting up, she had fallen asleep with a biladu in her hand or by her side. So, this is the first thing she reads. And then while dressing up on the dressing table, we see that Bilidu is mentioned right after Bible is mentioned. So, this idea of confused values or mixed priorities, I had used the word random in that context, right? The randomness of reality. That is seen again reenacted on the altar of love prepared by the Baron. So, although Belinda and the Baron, they are presented as antagonists, you know, opposite to each other, they are basically on the same side, on the same side of non-intelligent, non-intellectual, silly gentility, where values are so confused. So, this Baron, he is lighting these love letters up in a pyre and breathes three amorous sighs to raise the fire, then prostrate falls and begs with ardent eyes. So then he is falling prostrate, he is falling almost without action and just praying with his eyes, O oh God, please grant me the two locks and all. And what happens then? Soon to obtain and long possess the prize. The powers gave ear. Yes, the gods listened to him and granted half his prayer, but not entirely. This is where he is again playing with the epic convention of the interfering gods. Usually in epics, we see that gods interfere in the lives of men, of heroes, but they don't give them absolute power. There is always a catch. And not just divine power, even mischievous powers, you know, like the devil in Dr. Faustus, the witches in Macbeth, they all come, grant some prayers, but only half the prayers. And here too, Pope is following that convention that only half of Baron's desire will be fulfilled. Now, why this is a literal truth that we will come to know at the end of the third canto. So, we will have to wait for that, okay? I will not tell you why half the prayer is said here, okay? But you remember that the gods had granted him half his prayer, okay? The rest, the winds dispersed in empty air. So, half his prayer was granted, half his prayer was dissolved, non-existent. So, coming back to Belinda, but now secure, the painted vessel glides. Vessel means the boat. So, we think that painted vessel means the beautiful boat on which Belinda was, uh, you know, having her party that is sailing about. But no, this is not just the boat. Usually, uh, this comparison between a woman and a vessel is not very unnatural. And here, painted vessel immediately brings to our mind the idea that Belinda had painted herself literally. You know, by degrees a purer blush arise, you remember that phrase? So, she was actually painting herself with patches and foundation and what not. So, she is the painted vessel and she is on the painted vessel. The sunbeams trembling on the floating tides. Again, trembling, 
because the sunbeams are very conscious because something brighter than them is around this river while melting music steals upon the sky and softened sounds along the waters die smooth flow the waves the zephyrs gently play belinda smiled and all the world was gay this is where you begin to forget that pope is writing a mock epic this is where pope is writing a beautiful piece of pastoral poetry almost filled with the images of romance but when we pay attention to the word you know melting music you remember that in the first canto we were warned by ariel about these moments you know when the maids are melting so these are the moments of temptation so these moments which appear as beautiful moments are basically moments of falling in love and which is another way of saying that moments of entrapment moments where maids need to be extra careful zephyrs means gentle westerly winds very soothing and this expression belinda smiled and all the world was gay it is as if she is determining the fate of humanity it's like the sun rises and everybody is happy that kind of a feeling so this is again a magnification of our actual beauty a deliberate inflation which is needed by pope all but the sylph sylphs are not gay they are very nervous because these are the moments they should be careful about plus ariel had a warning right because something awful was going to happen to belinda he knew all but the sylph so this is one particular sylph that is ariel here with careful thoughts oppressed the impending woe sat heavy on his breast impending means something which is about to happen in near future so all he was thinking was something bad is going to happen how can i be happy how can i be relaxing now he summons straight his denizens of air denizens means his army his comrades his followers so he summons them he calls them so there are many sylphs under his rule or his jurisdiction they come the lucid squadrons around the sails repair so all his followers tiny little elves or sylphs they come and gather around him soft over the shrouds aerial whispers breed so just above that uh, sail so there was this vessel and they assembled on the top where the sails was tied up and there ariel was whispering to them because ariel doesn't speak in a loud voice even to belinda he was always whispering and that is why that sound appeared to be like the sound of the rustling wind to the people who were having the party below because the world of the sylphs and the world of the humans must not collide we will see that they are parallel to each other the sylphs can see what is happening but they cannot actually touch the world of the humans like literally they cannot touch the humans and why i'll tell you later soft over the shrouds aerial whispers breathe that seemed but zephyrs that seemed to be like the wind to the train beneath train means not the railway train but uh, to the people the band of people who were having a party down okay so that is the train some to their son now the sylphs are described i'll just uh, rush over these the description uh, kind of links these uh, sylphs to dragonflies and butterflies that kind of descriptions are used some to the sun their insect wings unfold waft on the breeze or sink in clouds of gold transparent forms too fine for mortal sight so the wings they are made of so fine a material that human eyes cannot even see them their fluid bodies half dissolved in light loose to the wind their airy garments flew thin glittering textures of the filmy dew so their their garments are also made of this filmy dew which is a very thin and transparent thing we cannot see that with naked eyes and then something very interesting here where light disports in ever mingling dyes dyes means colors so their wings are like glass and on their wings if the light falls it gets dispersed now why is it so important because this was the time when sir isaac newton had published his book 
the optics and there he had talked about the prism and the mechanism of light dispersing into seven colors and all that. So, this is where Pope is bringing in the scientific thoughts of his times very wittily in his poems. So, this is where the contemporary society is kind of reflected even in the description of things like the bodies and garments of the sylphs. With every beam new transient colors flings, colors that change whenever they wave their wings and of course, depending on the movement of the wings, the dispersal changes and somehow it creates the prism effect. Amid the circle on the gilded mast, so the mast of the vessel or that cruise ship or that boat, that mast is the central part of the boat and on the top of the mast, Ariel was sitting perched on it and he was addressing his fellow selves. Superior by the head was Ariel placed his purple pinions opening to the sun now because he is the king figure. So, he has purple colored wings. He raised his azure wand and thus begun the wand and this is again the reenactment of Satan speaking to his rebel angels. Awake, arise or be forever fallen. So, that kind of a grandeur is given to a figure who is like an insect. So, it is not just making fun of Ariel, it is making fun of Satan. This whole idea of actually trying to prove somebody that I am your leader, where the leader is equally powerless. And let us see what he says. He sills and sylphids. Now, what are sylphids? Sylphids are lady sylphs. Although sylphs do not have any sexual identity, but when they look like women, they are sylphids. And when they look like men, they are sylphs. Now, this was given in that book Gabalis, that novel. Okay. He sylphs and sylphids to your chief, give ear. Now, the kind of expression that is used here, give ear. Who speaks like this? Somebody who is going to deliver a grand speech as in an epic and epics are filled with grand speeches. So, that idea of the grand speech is carried out here. Fays, fairies, jenny, elves and demons here. We know the spheres and various tasks assigned by laws eternal to the aerial kind. So, you know about the different kinds of work that the creatures of the air, the supernatural creatures who belong to the air, they are assigned different kinds of work. So, you know about that. And then he gives the list of different kinds of work that supernatural beings take uh, responsibility for or are assigned to. What kind of work? Some in the fields of purest ether play and bask and whiten in the blaze of day. So, some of these supernatural beings out of these fays, fairies, genie, elves and demons, out of these some are assigned jobs in the ethereal plane that is a higher plane, higher sky you can say. Some guide the course of wandering orbs on high. So, some are very powerful and they take care of the planets uh, and make sure that they remain in their orbits. So, this idea of orbs wandering, this is also uh, reinforcing the idea of not a Miltonic worldview. Milton's idea of paradise, hell, heaven, earth, that idea does not coincide with the scientific idea, but Pope's idea coincides with the scientific idea because he is not chained down, restricted by the need to justify the Bible. He does not have to give you all those justification of God's ways, justification of biblical ideas. He is free to give you the scientific theories of his time. Let us see, planets are simply orbs and then when he says that the supernatural beings take care of those orbits, we understand that he is actually making fun of the whole idea of any supernatural being making sure that the planets are moving properly or roll the planets through the boundless sky, some less refined beneath the moon's pale light pursue the stars that shoot athwart the night. Now, we also know about shooting stars, but are shooting stars really stars? No, they are meteorites, right, which fall from the sky. So, some are assigned the role of taking care of those things that fall like shooting stars. 
or suck the mists in grosser air below or dip their pinions in the painted bow. So, if there is a rainbow, somebody's job is to uh, color their wings in that. So, are these really jobs? Will these jobs not be done if these creatures do not exist? So, that is the beauty of it that these supernatural beings are assigned the tasks which could very well go without them. They are not needed at all. So, no matter how grand it might sound, these airy creatures are useless, not needed anymore in a world which is explained by science, which is explained by logic in an age that is called the age of reason and wit. And then he goes on saying, or dip their pinions in the painted bow, or brew fierce tempests on the wintry main. Main is that ocean, and uh, they bring about these storms, or over the globe distill the kindly rain. So he is going on using this word or 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 for four sentences. He is beginning the lines with the word or, and this particular figure of speech is called an anaphora. So, when you begin two, three, four lines with the same word that creates an emphasis, a repetitiveness and here this is the repetitiveness of silliness. Others on earth over human race preside, some of them take care of human beings and guide their actions, watch all their ways and all their actions guide. So, that is the responsibility of some of the supernatural beings that they take care of human beings, their actions, their choices like those witches in Macbeth may be. Of these the chief, the care of nations own and guard with arms divine the British throne. And because England is the ruler of the world, therefore the ruler of England is the most powerful person on earth and therefore his protection is the responsibility of the most powerful of these supernatural beings. Our humbler province is to tend the fair. Now, he is talking about the responsibility of the sylphs in particular. So, till now he was talking about supernatural beings who belong to the world of air in general. Now, specifically about the sylphs. This we have seen him talking about in the first canto too. Not a less pleasing though less glorious care. So, he himself admits that the job assigned to them is of less importance than the job assigned to the aerial creature who looks after the ruler of England or who look after the planets and their positions or the tempests on sea. But it is not less pleasing because he feels that their job is very beautiful to save the powder from too rude a gale. When somebody puts makeup, the powder, there is this wind that rushes across your face and that ruins the powder. So, their job is to stop that from happening. It might also mean that if you open the container of powder, sometimes it blows in the wind. The sails stop that. What a glorious job they have nor let the imprisoned essences exhale. So, when you keep perfume in a bottle, they evaporate mostly. Uh, if they come in contact with the air, the cells make sure that they do not evaporate. But if you keep them properly corked, that is the cap is tightly sealed, then it will not evaporate. So, see their job is basically Again, something actually non-existent because no matter how many cells are taking care of a bottle of perfume, if you keep it open, it will evaporate. The cells can't stop that. To draw fresh colors from the vernal flowers, to steal from rainbows or they drop in showers, a brighter wash, to curl their waving hairs. So, their job is to make sure that after the hair is washed, it is given a brilliant coloration. So, basically to supervise hair dyeing process, assist their blushes and inspire their airs. We have seen them doing that in Belinda's case, right? 
Nay, oft in dreams inventions we bestow, they come in dreams and they provide invention. Now, normally the word invention is associated with something very serious. In fact, Dr. Johnson in his Life of Pope, uh, that book he wrote that Pope has invention, creativity. So, Pope is loosely using this word invention here by associating it with something very trivial. The sylphs, they come in dreams to inspire and what is the inspiration for? To change a flounce or add a fur below. Now, this flounce, fur below, these are all different styles of clothing, you know, uh, laces and frills, pleats. So, women dream and in their dreams, all they dream about is how to add a frill here and there. So, they think about all insignificant things. That is their limit of invention. This day, black omens threat the brightest fair. Now, he is giving some concrete information to the sylphs that see, this is our job and today uh, something bad is going to happen. This day, black omens threat the brightest fair. Who is the brightest fair? Belinda. That ever deserved a watchful spirit scare, some dire disaster, or by force or slight. But what or where? The fates have wrapped in night, secret. We don't know what's going to happen. Whether the nymph shall break Diana's law, or some frail china jar receive a flaw. Diana is the goddess of chastity. So, when a woman breaks the Diana's law, it means she breaks her virginity. So, that could be something that might happen to Belinda. She might lose her chastity. She might break Diana's law. Or some frail china jar receive a flaw. Or it might also happen that some china jar, some jar made of bone china might crack or break today. So, he is equating this breaking of Diana's law with breaking of some glass jar. And that is because in the ideology of the sylphs, the Bible, the Biladu, all are on the same platform. And as I was telling you in the very first introductory class, that the sylphs act as kind of altered ego of Belinda. They represent whatever she feels about the world. And for her, maidenly honor is as important as her china jar. And in this world, in reality, isn't it the actual scenario too? Aren't people really very obsessed about material things than about things like honor, chastity, commitment or stain her honor or her new brocade. Stain means to make dirty. So, it might happen that she might stain her honor. So, it is a metaphor used here. Honor is uh, associated with staining, although usually we associate stain with clothes. So, something might happen that Belinda's honor might be stained or her new brocade or her dress. And here we see the beautiful application of Ziyuguma. When you are reading the Rip of the Lock, you must remember what a Ziyuguma is. It is where a verb or adjective is used for two different nouns and these two different nouns belong to completely opposite ideas and even contrary at times. How is it used here? To stain her honor or her new brocade. So, the linking verb here is stain. You can say stain her honor to mean that to lose her virginity or chastity and stain her new brocade means to make her dress dirty. Okay? Using this in the same sentence, in the same breath, 
makes it look as if for Belinda, honor and brocade, these two are seen on the same platform. And the sylphs, they are careful about both of these things equally. So this is a mixed priority thing. They have this completely confused idea about priorities. Forget her prayers or miss a masquerade. So forgetting her prayer is as gruesome as missing a party. Now this is like 18th century. It's not 21st century where we might not find this that stupid because praying is not a part of our daily rituals for most of us, many of us, especially if you are young students. Of course, you don't pray every day for a certain period of time. But you feel very heartbroken if one of your friends, they throw a party and you miss that somehow, right? So you won't understand this weirdness that Pope intends uh, to make us feel. But here in this context, missing a prayer is considered to be sacrilegious, something that affects your soul. And missing a party is something very silly. So if you are associating the two, you are creating humor at least for the 18th century readers. Or lose her heart or necklace at a ball. Again, Zyugma. Losing a heart equal to losing a necklace, all equally horrible. Or whether heaven has doomed that shock must fall. It might also happen that the lab dog might fall. Fall means here also mean uh, he might die. Now why is the dog coming here always? Like in the first canto also we have seen that there's this lab dog uh, popping in. And here this reference to the lab dog popping in again. Perhaps because this whole idea of lab dog as a you know, husband surrogate almost, as a lover surrogate, you are showering a lab dog with kind of love you would normally shower your companion with, human companion with. That is being uh, kind of hinted at here and later Pope will actually say that in, in a couple of lines. I will uh, remind you again there when we will read those lines where husbands and lap dogs are actually mentioned together to create this humor. But this is not unnatural. This is a very normal thing, especially for women who do not have the you know, exclusive access to a man. It is natural for them to have a bond with a pet animal especially when they can control that animal completely. And that sense of possession they feel with that lap dog is way bigger than the sense of possession they feel with their husbands. So if shock falls, that would be as tragic a thing as losing her honor. Haste then is spirit, so because anything can happen, so what you should do, you should be very careful, you should pay complete attention to her today. And then he assigns some roles, some duties to specific cells. So here we have that role calling of uh, angels kind of thing here happening. To your charge repair, the fluttering fan be Zephyritus care. So, women used to carry these Japanese fans, you know, uh, as style statements and Zephyrita, the name of the self is Zephyrita, would take care of that fan. So, that the fan doesn't, what, get folded in a bad way, doesn't get torn in any way. I don't know how a, a self would take care of a fan, but Zephyrita was supposed to do that. Interestingly, the word Zephyrita is connected with the word Zephyr and a few moments back I had told you what Zephyr means. Zephyr means the westerly wind. So the sylph who will take care of Belinda's fan already has the name Zephyrita. It is as if that sylph was born to be in charge of Belinda's fan. That's why its name is Zephyrita. What else would it take care of? And then we have the drops to the brilliante we consign. 
So, brilliant means something which is bright and shiny and brilliante will take care of Belinda's drops. Drops are these uh, earrings, you know, uh, drops from her ears, maybe made of pearl or something. And momentila, guess what? Momentila, let the watch be thine. That pressed watch probably. Moment, again, it, it's equal to time. And so, momentila will look after the watch. So, is Ariel actually assigning any role to them or are they predestined for these roles? So, see, the way in which Ariel is assigning these roles gives an air of command as if he has authority to decide which sylph will do what. But basically, he has no power at all. Even on his sylphs, they, they will do what they are supposed to do. And finally, do thou, Crispisa, tend her favorite lock. So, Crispisa, it has the word crisp and locks when uh, they are shaped in curls, they are very crispy looking. So, Crispisa will look after the lock. So, it will be easy for you to remember in the exams which self took care of what, right? And what will Ariel look after? Ariel himself shall be the guard of shock. Now, Ariel is referring to himself as Ariel. It is like a very royal thing to do. When you address yourself as the third person, if I say Munami Mukherjee is very happy, I give a very emperor-like air attitude. So, that is what Ariel is giving here. And he is going to look after shock. Now, normally we would think that what kind of a guardian self are you? You are actually abandoning Belinda and looking after the dog. You should be actually looking after everything to do with Belinda. But you see, five minutes back I had told you what the dog might actually mean to Belinda. How important is the dog to Belinda? So when Ariel decides to supervise shock, it is not a shock for us. We know the value system of Belinda. And we know the place shock holds in that value system. To 50 chosen selves of special note, we trust the important charge, the petticoat. And then he assigns 50 selves the job of taking care of Belinda's petticoat. Now, petticoat is more like an elaborate structure that gives form to the gown. Okay. And Petticoats were designed with different layers and the outermost layer was quite beautiful and exquisite. So, it was not just an undergarment as it is uh, understood today. And why is the petticoat important? Oft have we known that sevenfold fence to fail, though stiff with hoops and armed with ribs of whale. Petticoats back then used to be structured like these domes and that structure was made with bamboo sticks and if you are very rich it might be made with bones of whales and this is called a fence because what does a fence do? It protects a property from thieves, from robbers, right? It's like a wall. The petticoat protects the body of the woman from sexual advances. And therefore, it is called a fence. Now, the moment he is using the word sevenfold fence, he is actually talking indirectly about the shield of Achilles. You know, that grand thing that was prepared by Vulcan and Despite having his shield, Achilles died. So, Ariel says that it is not unnatural for a petticoat to you know, simply fail to protect a woman's honor. So, 50 sylphs will be in charge of the petticoat of Belinda, making sure that the structure remains solid and strong because the petticoat is the defense of her honor. Form a strong line about the silver bound and guard the wide circumference around. So, you are supposed to surround that petticoat, hold on to the end, 
so that the gown does not lift up in any way or the structure does not break in any way and then he gives a warning here. Whatever spirit careless of his charge, his post neglects or leaves the fair at large, if you leave her under any circumstance, shall feel sharp vengeance soon overtake his sins, it will be a sin for you and there will be punishment. Be stopped in vials or transfixed with pins. What punishments is he talking about? That sylphs who will not take care of Belinda, will not perform his duty, they will be enclosed in vials. So, if they are small little creatures, their punishments also are ludicrously small. If you start picturing the punishments, the whole images become funny and not horrible at all, although he is using pretty horrible words here or plunged in lakes of bitter washes lie. So, you will be thrown in some cosmetic wash or waged whole ages in a botkin's eye. It is a blunt needle. If you do not do your duty, you will be put in that hole at the back of that needle for ages. Comes and pomatums shall his flight restrain. Uh, your wings will be you know restrained with gums and all. Uh, pomatums are these uh, serums which are used, ointments for the hair. While clogged he beats his silken wings in vain. So, when the sylphs, the negligent sylphs uh, will be soaked in gums, they cannot flap their wings or alum styptics with contracting power shrink his thin essence like a revealed flower. Alum styptics is a particular, uh, you can't call it a cosmetic, it is more like a chemical that is used for healing wounds at times and it ends up contracting the skin. And if you are a self and not perform your duties, you will be like kind of drenched in that alum styptics and definitely it will make you shrink or as Ixion fixed, the wretch shall feel the giddy motion of the whirling mill. Who was Ixion? Ixion was punished by Zeus and his punishment was, he was attached to this wheel, turning wheel. So that, that punishment was grand, but that similar punishment will be given to a sylph, but this wheel will not be the wheel of Ixion, but of the whirling mill. In fumes of burning chocolate shall glow and tremble at the sea that froths below. So, they will be burnt and drenched in hot chocolate. He spoke. The spirits from the sails descend. So, they are very serious now. Their commander has spoken and just in the same way uh, as after Satan's speech, the rebel angels, they decide to kind of build this pandemonium uh, for this meeting that they are going to have. So, we see a lot of activity after the speech and the same thing happens here. The spirits from the sails descend some orb in orb around the nymph extend just like angels you know they are standing in orb in orb and this is again uh, bodily taken from paradise lost uh, where in book 5, the angels they stood orb in orb. So, here orb means circle. So, they are encircling Belinda instead. Some thread the mazy ringlets of her hair. So, some take care of her hair. Some hang upon the pendants of her ear. So, some are taking care of her earrings. With beating hearts, the dire event they wait, anxious and trembling for the birth of fate. So, if you could see them, how would Belinda's appearance look to you? How would she actually look to you? Picture her. She is standing there with these insect like elves all about her. Some near her ears, some near her eyes, some near her petticoat and even a dog, she would look like an alien. So, what makes her beautiful is something that basically makes her ugly, if you could actually see that. 
but since you cannot see that you see only her makeup and not the sylphs who are all about her scattered about her and so her beauty becomes like the sun because even in the sun there are these dark spots which we are not capable of seeing just because we can't simply look at the sun. Melinda is no different because she is as glorious as the sun and these sylphs have this feeling that they need to protect that glory. All through this second canto, Belinda is presented as a warrior on a conquest, as a military hero. We have her antagonist and there is this idea of a battle brewing, something about to happen, but something which is hidden from our eyes. We feel that we are petty mortals, we don't know about the future, but we see that even the sylphs, they don't know about the future. All they know about is that something might happen and they don't even know when or where or how. So finally, when we come to Canto 3, this background creation of Canto 1, the rising action of Canto 2 will naturally lead to the climax of Canto 3. So although this is structured like an epic, because it is mock epic, it also follows this five act structure of drama. Because in these ways, drama is very much like epic. Tragedies are. So what tragedy is going to happen, how that is going to take place and how Pope is going to magnify before he explodes that balloon of Belinda in that climax, we will find out in the third canto. I'll expect all of you to be with me in my next class where we will be doing a thorough line by line reading of the third canto of the Rape of the Lock. Thank you all for being with me on this journey. Stay subscribed and share with your friends too. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Stay happy, stay smiling. Bye.